Okay. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome from uh, the East Coast to the Northwest. I was in your beautiful neck of the woods um, a year, two years maybe before COVID. Uh, we had a little family reunion up in Tacoma. Wish I was coming to NCCE this year. My good friend Jason Neifer, I think, is going to give the closing keynote and just uh, love the Pacific Northwest. And I also just love your focus in terms of media literacy and talking about how we need to be uh, educating ourselves and educating our students to be more literate for the 21st century. So I apologize that uh, to Sean, he's having to do some double duty here today with the slides, but I have just dropped into the chat three links. The first link is a shortened link that'll take you right to the slide deck, <clears throat> which has hyperlinks to many of the resources we'll talk about. And then I've also embedded that on my media literacy website. And then we've got a resource page for what we'll be talking about tonight conspiracies and culture wars. <clears throat> and uh, then there's a link to go ahead and connect with me. So um, and I, we, we, because I don't have the powers of remote control, I'll be asking Sean to advance our slides tonight. But su such, a, such it is when you have a teacher laptop <clears throat> without admin credentials and you haven't screen shared on this particular laptop and you can't put in the admin password. So thank you, Sean, for helping uh, get our slides working here tonight. Yeah, I'm gonna make sure that my audio and everything is turned on here, Wesley. No week. problem, no problem. Okay. Um, right. I'm ready so just, Okay, so just uh, to know a little bit as far as who's in the room, um, what what levels are you all working with, um, either as teacher, administrator, or or any other capacity, all, all levels? If you just wanna put that into the chat to kind of let me know um, a little bit about you. Um, let's go on and go to the next slide. Okay. So we're going to talk about how to teach about conspiracy theories without getting fired, but I've played around with some different names, and we also could call this media literacy in January 6th, uh, teaching about conspiracy theories and civic responsibilities. Um, what we're talking about today is really a media literacy inquiry project that started for me back in 2019, and I've had a few opportunities to share this at some conferences. Uh, the, the Mountain Moot up in Montana a couple summers ago, and most recently um, in Orlando last April at the, at the Atlas Conference. But I really am trying myself to connect a lot of dots when it comes to what we see happening all around us in terms of culture war and so much talk about conspiracy theory. <clears throat> and then tonight, I want to really try to link that to what I see as civic responsibilities um, as citizens, I, I know that we have both rights and responsibilities, and I really think that these topics are super important. Um, I personally don't think we're going to, quote, media literacy ourselves out of the difficult situation in which we find ourselves with political polarization, but I definitely think media literacy has a huge role to play, and so I'll be talking about um, all of those things tonight. We can go to the next slide. So... Um, I've listened to this wonderful book by Ezra Klein, and I'm a, fa a fan of his podcast, Why We're Polarized. Um, and, and there are a lot of different reasons for that. And I think Ezra has some pretty good, good, good ideas about it. Tonight, the overarching question that I'd like to try to address is how can we constructively educate students about what I would consider to be dangerous conspiracy theories in our politically polarized world? Um, I am coming to you tonight from North Carolina, where I just moved with my wife and one of our daughters um, this past August. I was in Oklahoma for 16 years, and I've been a Midwesterner most of my life. Um, and <clears throat> teaching wherever we happen to teach, uh, we've, got, we've got a lot of folks with a lot of different political ideas. And it can it can be dangerous for us as educators and, and just as citizens and especially folks that might be connected to the Internet as we are uh, in terms of uh, social media. It's it's a perilous time. And but it's important to talk about these issues and to find ways that we can be talking about them in school. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. We can go to the next slide. So one of the things that's super important and here's a, a flashback picture to, from COVID. This is it. My my my. Uh, Oklahoma school, Cassidy school, we were still wearing masks. I share this with my students and I have sent an, a video actually to all of my parents <clears throat> for each of the seven terms that I have taught the, the lesson that I'm going to share with you tonight um, that, that just to give you a spoiler, focuses on the Apollo moon landings and talks about how some folks say we never landed on the moon. Of course, there's some folks that say 
the earth is flat and those people can sometimes be the same people. Um, and so sometimes we'll laugh about that, but there are, are serious rabbit holes that folks can fall into. And so what I want to number one, share with you, and, and I share this with my students and I share this with my parents, that I am not here to politically indoctrinate in terms of trying to make someone a Democrat, a Libertarian, a Socialist, a Republican, any, any you know flavor of political party. <clears throat> Our focus and my focus here is to really think about critical thinking and how we can be better prepared to make decisions specifically about who to trust online, because the world, I believe, is more fractured and polluted with respect to information than it ever has been before. And it's incumbent upon us as educators, no matter what level we teach and no matter where we happen to be teaching, to help students become more literate for the world that we live in today and the future that we're moving into. And I think that's important to share. And I will say that having taught this, for, for three years in Oklahoma and now last semester in uh, Charlotte. Um, and so we had trimesters in my previous school. Um, so I guess actually I've taught it. Yeah. And I, I, I taught it the last two years. So I've, I've taught it seven different uh, times in terms of terms, never had any negative parent feedback. In fact, it's been quite the opposite. Parents have been really excited um, because, and this is part of the reason why my friend Brian Turnbaugh from Chicago and I ended up picking the moon landings. I haven't had any angry parents upset that I'm defending the Apollo program and explaining, you know, how it really did happen in, in, in July of 1969, you know, that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the surface of the moon. So anyway, that's an important thing I think to put out there. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of an outline tonight, well, let me just first uh, tell you a tiny bit about myself. So I've been teaching since uh, 1995. I started life in education as a fourth grade teacher after uh, being in the Air Force. Uh, this is my current robotics class at Providence Day School. Uh, we have about 1,800 kids in Southeast Charlotte. I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students. Currently, I teach four different classes. Two are the media literacy classes, which our school calls computer applications, but I also teach an introduction to engineering class, and I'm teaching a robotics class, and this is my robotics class. And so all of my lessons uh, are shared on my Westfriar website, and it's at lessons.westfriar.com. I'm a big fan of Google Sites. I teach my kids how to use Google Sites to make portfolios, and so I'm being a little bit fancy here with my registered domain. Um, and I'm using something called a C name registration, but that means instead of www, I do other things in front of .westfriar.com. So lessons.westfriar.com is where you can find the lesson that we'll be talking about tonight about conspiracy theories and culture wars, or what I call Fruit Loop conspiracy theories. And then you can also get all the media literacy uh, resources by just putting it in medialiteracy.westfriar.com. Next slide, please. I, I guess I could have mentioned on there, I'm on Mastodon now as well. I'm still on Twitter, but uh, not being super happy with Elon for different reasons. I'm I'm pondering a departure from Twitter, but I'm still there. So here's our outline tonight. I'd like to talk about just briefly why should we talk about conspiracy theories, which could potentially be perilous for us, whether we're librarians, as I see many of you are, <clears throat> you know, uh, high school, middle school, elementary, why in the world we want to talk about this. And I'm going to talk about developmentally appropriate decisions when it comes to this, because there are so many, again, rabbit holes and places that this can go. I'm teaching middle school students. So in Oklahoma, I was teaching fifth and sixth grade students. Here in Charlotte, I'm teaching uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. We'll talk about a little bit of, uh, in terms of reasons. I want to give you an overview of the unit, and I also want to play some examples of student work. I'm going to play an example of a narrated sketch note. I absolutely love sketch noting, and that's just a a media literacy product <clears throat> that we learn how to create and we share. And then I'm going to play uh, probably uh, just one student example, but there's several different ones that are great. And then I also am going to give you some prescriptions or action steps that are some things you can do um, right away and then maybe in the future that I think can help not only educate students, but also parents and others in our community, but also move us forward with respect to the polarized times in which we live and the need that we have for, you know, compromise, um, uh, listening to each other and, and really stepping up, I think, to our responsibilities as well as our rights as citizens. Next slide, please. So why teach about conspiracy theory? Um, actually, let's do this in the chat. Has anybody taught about conspiracy theories uh, 
like in the last couple of years, <laughs> is anybody entering into that? And if and if you are, and you'd like to share uh, any links or you know any any details as far as what you're doing, um, we're going to talk about the SIFT Media Literacy Framework. I think you all are pretty familiar with that, and uh, just absolutely love that. Um, I've become a little bit uh, you know acquainted with some of the projects the um, that that are that have given birth to SIFT. And go ahead and go to the next slide. So I want to I want to start off with a metaphor and then a story. I'm not exactly sure. We've got a little block of uh, black there, Sean, on the on the screen. I don't know. You may want to may want to exit out of the screen share and then start it again. Um, I love to smoke barbecue and cook steaks and things like that. Uh, and so I'm going to give a give you a little bit of a metaphor here, and then I want to tell you a story, which which I actually have not shared in a public presentation before, but I think it's it's very appropriate uh, to our topic. Well, yeah. now it's worse. Now it's <laughs> we, worse. We've actually got yeah, we've actually got a couple like these are sort of rectangular artifacts. We can go on to the next slide. We'll see if if maybe it'll it'll heal itself. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can see the steak. So I want to use the metaphor of marinating, and I want you to think about what it is that you you have your brain marinating on a regular basis in. Uh, my grandmother, who I had an opportunity to spend a number of wonderful years with in Lubbock, Texas, uh, she used to have CNN on basically all day long. And then if you've ever uh, heard of Art Bell coast to coast, she would listen to Art Bell um, pretty much every night. And like this was the, the years leading up to, you know, Y2K and, you know, just she was feisty and she was fired up. And, you know, those 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 media sources that she was watching definitely contributed to her sense of, uh, you know, what what was going on in the world and, and her perspective. So I've learned, uh, you know, cooking steaks, you know, if I can set this up for the, the night before, I can put a, some some good you know kosher salt on there. It's going to permeate into the meat. My steak is going to taste so much better. It's going to literally transform the meat into uh, something better because of the fact that it's marinating. And the the case that I would make today is that if we're not intentional about the kinds of media that we marinate in and that we um, uh, you know choose to to basically allow to inhabit our brains. Um, you know, we're going to be transformed as well. And we see this happening broadly in a lot of ways. And so I think this is an important thing for us to consider. Again, who is it that we're going to trust and what kinds of media are we going to choose to really, um, you know, put put into our minds, especially on a repeated a repeated basis. And, and these can be echo chambers that we live in. If you go to the next one, this is the story I've never told publicly before in a presentation. Uh, and I'm not going to go into it in, in too much depth here. We've still got these weird artifacts. There we go. It disappeared. Okay. Well, most of it. We've got one here at the bottom. So that's a picture of me at the Air Force Academy my senior year. That was uh, the fall of 1991. Um, has anybody ever heard of this book by Monica Jensen Stevenson, Kiss the Boys Goodbye? This was published in 1990. Um, when we talk about conspiracy theories, and I'm going to show a slide here in, in just a little bit that I use with my students, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories. But I personally um, almost really fell down a, a rabbit hole of a conspiracy theory um, in the fall of 1991 and leading up to that, reading a lot about our prisoners of war and, and missing in action in Southeast Asia. As you might recall, depending upon your age, the United States Senate had a special select committee for POW MIA affairs uh, that was active from uh, 19, I think it was from 91 to maybe 93. Uh, John Kerry, John McCain, Bob Smith were all uh, part of that. <clears throat> I actually traveled to Washington, D.C. in that fall of 1991, got to attend one of the hearings. And, um, you know, if you get too deep into a conspiracy theory, uh, it can be a very dark place. It can even be a place of nihilism. And I, you know, thankfully emerged from that. And, um, you know, I actually ended up getting in a little bit of trouble uh, at the United, at the Air Force Academy as a result of that. And I don't want to spend too much time telling that story, but I do want to say that I have a personal connection, as probably many of us do, if you know someone who has 
either maybe currently uh, subscribing to some pretty outlandish, you know, theories, um, or just somebody who's lost their faith in things like the church, like religion. Um, it could be the government. We're going to talk about, you know, faith and in institutions and how those have declined. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it's these things are powerful, and they have a they they can have a lot of effect on us. And you know, when I look back at that time, I spent a great deal of time, you know, reading about those that kind of material, and it kind of you know goes back to the marination thing. How, what what am I you know marinating in, and, and what kind of ideas uh, am I am I setting in my brain? All right, let's go to the next slide. So fast forward thir thirty two years. Here we are in twenty twenty three. And Pew Internet Research is a wonderful, you know, resource for so many different things. One of their headlines that caught my attention uh, a few months ago was that for Generation Z right now, TikTok is the number one search engine. It eclipses Google. It eclipses YouTube. That's a huge, huge headline. And of course, the fact that that algorithm is controlled by ByteDance, which is a Chinese company, is causing all kinds of, um, you know, legislation across the country in, in in the school where my daughter middle daughter attends college the university of central oklahoma you know the governor is, has uh, outlawed tiktok on all state networks and kids are on their cell phones using tiktok but it's it's really an interesting world that we live in and <clears throat> the fact that we've seen this decline that line graph that you see uh is from pew's um study that was published i think this was in uh 2021 um no, this was in, in, sorry, June of 2022, public trust in government, tracking it from 1958 to 2022. So steady decline, steady decline across the board. Um, I've got some graphics here that are from Wikipedia articles. If you're not familiar with what Pizzagate is and was, what QAnon is and was, um, what kind of conspiracy theories you know, have been talked about for years around President Barack Obama's birth certificate. Those particular conspiracy theories are not things that I'm addressing with middle school students, but they are continuing to be part of a conversation in our country. Um, and it's very easy, I would say, through social media and especially through YouTube um, to step into a very deep rabbit hole of conspiracy theory. Um, I've got some graphics also from Wikipedia from the January 6th um, attack on the United States Capitol. How the heck did we get to that point? Um, these are some things I've really been wondering about and I've really been investigating. And I can't tell you that I have the answers, but I certainly think I understand a lot more. And this is part of the inquiry that I want to invite you into. And you may already I'm sure we're, we're all in this to some degree, but I want to explicitly invite you into this because as we have opportunities to share resources, uh, to you know, exchange perceptions, and to think about, well, what is it that we can talk about in school today, again, without being fired, uh, or even without people getting angry at us, and not to say there aren't reasons to say things that people would get angry about, but... Um, you know, what are we going to do in this highly polarized environment with these things? How are we going to address these? Next slide, please. So I would say, and I've kind of already made this point, there are more rabbit holes to fall into than ever before today. And certainly during the pandemic and COVID, you know, there were all kinds of, of, of things that, that went on. We could probably exchange stories about how we're how we've been challenged at family gatherings you know it you really don't have to go very far today to to run into a situation where it can become awkward and difficult uh especially if if something uh, you know relating to to politics comes up if we go to the next slide um, i'm going to posit the following statement an unregulated attention economy poses an existential threat to representative democracy we've i don't know why sean we've still got We've got this uh, little rectangular artifact there at the bottom, but you guys have the link to the slides. Uh, how many of us have seen The Social Dilemma? That was a fantastic documentary. It was one of these, again, sort of flash in the pan events where, um, you know, we had a lot of uh, of angst and, 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 and hand wringing. We got to do something about this. As you can see from the subtitle there, they, they contend the platforms that connect us also control us. Um, Shoshana Zuboff, which I will admit I have not read her book. I've just listened to multiple videos and podcasts where she's presented about the age of surveillance capitalism, you know, talks about 
the age in which we live, where platforms have so much power and the algorithms that those platforms sort of opaquely use with, with us providing you know, the data um, have a real effect on the, the perceptions and I would say even the identities of millions and millions of people. Um, and so I think it's really important to teach about this because I think, you know, truth is important. And if if huge swaths of, of citizens in the United States disagree about basic things like, do we have an electoral system that we can trust or not? You know, can we have confidence in that election system working and the candidate that that has been declared the winner? These are foundational, basic things to representative democracy. And if those things go away, then I think we lose. I think we lose the country. I, I think that's actually a, a possibility. So it, it is a very, very serious issue. But again, in the context of what I'm teaching with middle school, <clears throat> we're not going there. We're not talking about any of those conspiracy theories that I've talked about so far other than the moon landing. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to do now is give you an overview of the unit. And I'm going to do that by sharing about five slides that I share on day three of my unit, and I'm about to start this with this semester's middle schoolers after our spring break, which happens starts next week. Um, and so I've put a link directly, those little blue boxes there in the corner from the slide deck will directly go to the entire slideshow. And all of this is shared under a Creative Commons uh, attrib attribution only license. So use it, use it, remix it, you know, do anything you would like to with it. We'll go to the next slide. I want to do a shout out to Ryan Turnbaugh, who on Twitter is, is WeGoTwits. Uh, he and I attended the Summer Institute in Me Digital Literacy um, with Renee Hobbs and many others up in Providence, Rhode Island in 2019. And we decided we wanted to do a project together. <clears throat> and what we ended up settling on was the Apollo moon landings, fact or fiction. And so a lot of this work came out of what Brian and I did. And I call this unit a Fruit Loop Conspiracy Theory Unit because, as I'll mention in a second, conspiracy theories have been around for a long time, and, and there are real conspiracies. I'm not here to say all conspiracies are false because that's not true. What I am here to say is that some are so wild and they're so out there, I would call them a Fruit Loop Theory. And one of the things I want to try to help my students do is identify those really wild out there Fruit Loop ideas and to avoid falling down a rabbit hole into them. So next slide, please. Big question that we want to answer in this unit. How do you decide what to believe? That's always been a big question. But I think in the past when there was there were fewer options for accessing information, uh, the the media and information landscape was less fractured and less polluted. I think it in some ways was easier. Okay, I'm not saying I want to go back nostalgically to the 1950s or to the 1870s. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that we have an incredible flood of information that is just surging all around us. And it can be very, very overwhelming and it can be confusing. And so it, in addition to hopefully believing, you know, what parents and teachers share, students and, and we as well have to decide online, who are we going to believe? What sources are credible? And how do I decide that? And that is an essential skill for the, the current day, for, for 2023. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of kinds of conspiracy theories. Uh, this comes from the Wikipedia's list of conspiracy theories, which incidentally, I'm not going to be encouraging my middle schoolers to go investigate all of those. But, you know, some of these would fit into a playful category. Hey, we saw Elvis at Graceland. Elvis is still alive. There's political conspiracy theories. We certainly saw some around COVID, right? Bill Gates was, you know, putting RFID chips in everybody's, you know, under everybody's skin, you know, so because he was going to, you know, make all this money since, he, you know, he's invested in, in vaccines. And he gave, you know, a TED talk, I think, about the coming pandemic, you know, many, several years before, before COVID. Uh, we've had conspiracy theories that are ancient, right? The Knights Templar, um, uh, the Masons, um, you know, those kinds of things. I don't, have you all heard of Sean Sean Dawson and his conspiracy theory about Chuck E. Cheese pizza? 
This is one that my kids, you know, educated me about, hadn't heard of it, but he invented it for likes. You know, he got tons and tons of views on YouTube. And I learned about that from my sixth graders a couple of years ago. And these things do have sort of a lifespan and some of them do. And in today's middle schoolers, are not as familiar with Sean Dawson. Some of them have heard of him before. We've got contentious conspiracy theories. You know, is there intelligent extraterrestrial life? Have have they been here to contact? You know, ancient aliens. You know, that's a show on Netflix, right? Um, you know, unfortunately, I would say climate change is contentious. You know, I came from a state where we just had a state senator. Um, stepped down, who wrote a whole book about how, you know, climate change and global warming was a, was was complete falsehood. And I had some very interesting discussions with people and one time a custodian for quite a while in our school who was just absolutely sure, you know, there's no climate change, there's no global warming. Um, there's also real conspiracy theories. And if we go to the next slide, um, this is one that I mentioned to my kids. We don't do a deep dive into it, uh, but I've read Annie Jacobson's Operation Paperclip, fantastic book about this operation in which the United States brought many, many Nazi German scientists to the United States, and they formed the core of our scientific cadre that built the Mercury, the, the uh, Gemini, and the Apollo uh, rockets and the ICBMs that you know, became the nuclear arsenal of the United States. Fascinating book, classified at the time, right? Kept secret. And yes, there was a conspiracy. How do we get those folks out? And it's okay, you can go to the next slide. So why are some conspiracy, why are conspiracy theories um, appealing? I don't know for sure, but some would say that we, we do like stories that have a malevolent villain, somebody clear to point to that is, this is the evil one, okay? This is the one I can point, you know, to this evil witch or whatever. Um, a simple story. The world is complex. And so some people will say a, a conspiracy theory is appealing because it simplifies things. Oh, that's what's really going on. It's not all this complicated stuff. It's just this simple answer. And then also perhaps a conspiracy theory offers some people reassurance amidst complexity, chaos, and change. And we're certainly experiencing a lot of that today. So if we go to the next slide, I introduce SIFT to my students, where we stop, investigate the source, we find better coverage, and we trace to the original. We spend most of our time stopping, investigating the source, and then finding better coverage. I mentioned a little bit doing reverse image searches, lateral we'll see, reading. I think we've lost the audio. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, that's terrible. Are we back? I can hear it. Yeah, you I hear you now. We're good. You do? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, folks. No, no, we're Okay, <laughs> so back to it. Back to it's it. It's okay. All right. So lateral reading is a super important skill. In fact, I bring a, a football into class and we do multiple laterals, you know, talking about we, we've got to go to another place. We can't just go to that website to read about the source. Um. Yeah, you can go on and go to the next slide. Okay. Um, we uh, use this wonderful, wonderful animated video called Conspiracy Theories and Crazy People by um, an animator called who goes by the handle The Odd Ones Out. I like to show the movie trailer for National Treasure because somewhere I personally think there's a line between a fun conspiracy theory, which I would put National Treasure in that category. I mean, our kids were more interested and excited to go see the Declaration of Independence and see the Constitution and the National Archives when we went to Washington, D.C. because of that movie than any other factor. You know, I think it's fun. I, I, I've enjoyed that. But also, I think there is a line at which, you know, a conspiracy theory becomes dangerous. And one of the things that the, the graphic um, illustrator and comedian and, and comic uh, the odd ones out points out is, you know, when, when people start to doubt science to the point that they refuse medical care, they not only refuse vaccines, they refuse to, you know, go to the doctor. Uh, there's, there's a point where they can become dangerous. We can go to the next slide. So these are the two uh, videos that we watch. Um, there's a, a, originally, I think, Australian, uh, J.P. Sears, that has created a video, 13 Reasons the Moon Landing Was Faked. And we compare what he says to a filmmaker who actually lives in, in Amsterdam now, S.G. Collins, who takes a very technical view of why NASA in 1969 did not have the technology to fake the moon landing. And we do that to compare and contrast 
and 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 really to seek better coverage and to talk about you know Sears as a comedian and as a source. We laterally read you know for both of both of these guys to check them out, um, and we use that as as a way to apply the SIF uh, framework. We can go to the next slide. So that's the end of the lesson slides that I that I have for you. And again, please grab these, use any of this that I'm I'm sharing. It's one of my action steps is please do a remixed version of this. You can go to the next slide. What I'd like to do now is share a couple examples of student work with you. Uh, back in 2013, when I wrote my second book, I created this website, showwithmedia.com. I love, love empowering students to share their voices and especially to be able to communicate with more than text, with media, with images, with the combination of text and images, with info pics, to make sketch notes, to be able to create digital stories, all these different you know things. And so what would I like to go to next it is going to be uh, some student work examples. So the, on the left, you've got a very um, great example of a sketch note. Now, many of the sketch notes which my students create do not look anything like this. They are they, they look a lot more like a Pictionary drawing that you know you've you've done on a Friday night with your family. Um, but sometimes, you know, I'll have kids that will really do an, an incredible amount of detail, um, and that was the case that with Mahi's drawing here. A sketch note is a non-linguistic and linguistic way of representing ideas, literally having some ideas come into your head through your eyes and your ears, and then leave your body through your hand in a sketch that you create. And so um, as we were watching um, the movie about, or sorry, the the video about from J.P. Sears about 13 Reasons the Moon Landing was Fake, Though the, this was a little bit of the sketch note on the left that she created. Um, on the upper right is an info pic that one of my students created about investigating the source, showing, you know, a little sieve there sifting. Um, and, and I like to have my students narrate these on Seesaw. And so if we go to the next slide, um, I'm going to ask Sean to go ahead and click the link. This is going to jump out to a shared Seesaw example. And this is actually one that I recorded. So this is a sketch note that I created. This is about the odd ones out. Um, conspiracy theories and crazy people. And if you can click that link, Sean, it hopefully is going to pop out. We've got that artifact at the bottom. I don't know if that's blocking you. There you go. And then let's, let's play about 30 seconds of this. Hi, this is Dr. Fryer, and today's January 13th, 2022. Uh, today we started our conspiracy theories um, unit uh, looking at Fruit Loop conspiracy theories, and we watched a video called Conspiracies and Crazy People by James Ralston, who has the Odd Ones Out YouTube channel. Um, he talked about how he worked at Subway with crazy people, and some of them even denied modern medicine, and he thinks there should be a line between what you actually believe it shouldn't hurt other people. Um, but he does admit that he likes watching crazy people online and other places. Um, and I think that's a pretty insightful comment because one of the reasons okay, why you can go ahead and pause that. so many sort of out. One of the things I really hope that Google, oh, sorry that my, my, my Google smart speaker is going to start playing losing my religion by REM. What is it doing doing that? Um, I'm going to unplug it. Um, it's always weird when you're, AI smart speaker starts, in, you know, interrupting your uh, your presentation. I wish that Google Apps allowed for the easy adding of audio, you know, without any kind of extension or plugin. And I like using Seesaw for that, and I also like the fact that parents, you know, can be able to get a view. So even even though I'm not teaching elementary, which most of the time Seesaw is using a lot of elementary classrooms, I've used it for the last four years in my middle school class. Okay, if we can go back to the slides. Um, the next example that I want to show you, and I've got two linked here, I'm going to show you the Adobe Express version. The one on the right, <laughs> I wish I could take credit for all her skills, uh, but one of my students who had previously learned Wii video truly created a phenomenal video um, that is synchronized so well. Um, but it's it, it's the best video I've ever had a student create in this project. We'll go ahead and listen to the one on the left, and we'll listen to the whole thing. It's just under two minutes long. You can go ahead and click on it, Sean, to set it up. Um, I really, really like to use um, Adobe, what used to be called um, um, Adobe Spark, and now it's called Adobe Express, but it's free. 
I have learned over time that students generally can create a higher quality video product by using still images with a script and recording their voice than by shooting live action video. Live action video is pretty tough to it, comparatively to create a, a high quality product. So this is a culminating video that has been created after at the end of this unit. And we actually have a celebration party with popcorn and Fruit Loops and we have some tang because in one of the videos, when they talk about the shining and the whole idea that Stanley Kubrick faked the moon landing, they mentioned Tang and all of that. So let's just go ahead and play this and we'll listen to this one. Hi, this is Tisha, and today is November 2nd, 2021. Today, I'd like to share with you some of the things I learned in our sixth grade media literacy class unit on Fruit Loop conspiracy theories and using SIF to evaluate information in our digital world. To figure out if a source is trustworthy, we use SIFT to help us evaluate information in our digital world. The S in SIFT stands for stop. The I in SIFT stands for investigate the source. The F in SIFT stands for find better coverage. The T in SIFT stands for trace the original. We also have to do lateral reading to decide if a source is trustworthy. To do lateral reading, go to a different website that talks about the creator or the content in the video or website. Make sure that the new website is not by the creator of the video or the website you just previously saw. Reading laterally is very important because it helps you figure out if the creator slash content is trustworthy. In this unit, we compare two YouTubers that had different beliefs in the moon landing. The first YouTuber's name was J.P. Sears, and he was a comedian. Sears was a person who was anti-moon landing and thought they filmed the whole thing on camera, but it had nothing but some silly evidence. The second YouTuber's name was S.G. Collins, who was a real movie director. He had some real evidence toward the anti-moon landing people, and he said that it was not fake. Because according to his job, in 1947, this whole thing could have not been filmed on camera. In conclusion, I think that everybody should believe what they want to believe. After... Finding out more about the source and reading laterally. Photos by Unsplash.com, voice over by Eshel. <laughs> All right. So, yes, in 1947 or 1969, we couldn't have gone to the moon. So I think she's right. Um, all right. So those are some examples. I love showing student work like that. So the final thing I'd like to share, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, and by the way, we're not, we'll remove from the recording of uh, the, the Q&A part, um, or just some, some action steps if we can go on to the next uh, two slides. Um, so first prescription, please, please, um, and you can go to the next slide, teach a remix version of this lesson. Uh, like I said, I've been teaching this now for seven different terms uh my past school trimesters now i've got a semester so i have more a little, little bit more time um and all of these resources are available in the in the video by sg collins we've got a little background sound going from somebody um there's actually a <laughs> there's a there's a small part that's a sexual reference that I just didn't want to go there with my students and so I have a I have taken that video and removed those four seconds and I have that linked in the slideshow that all of that stuff is available for for you to use and um, I would would love that because I've I, like I said I've been able to share this at a couple different conferences and I don't know of anybody who's like really you know taking it on to say hey I'm going to give this a shot and try this but if any of this is helpful and useful to you please you know utilize it that's that's recommendation number 1 we can go to the next slide recommendation number 2 I encourage you to find a catalyst in this case. So like I, there, nothing could be better than uh Devil's Toothpaste by Mark Rober to talk about a catalyst a catalyst is something that that causes a reaction to happen and so find catalysts in your own life that move you forward in the teaching and learning journey around media literacy, and I would say specifically conspiracies and culture wars. As much as I would like to say that, you know, after this next election cycle or here in, in five years, we're going to just stop hearing about conspiracy theories or we're going to stop, you know, political polarization is going to end, the culture war is going to be over. I don't think that's actually going to happen. I see no signs at all that indicate, you know, anything except at this point, you know, more vitriol. And so um, this opportunity to share with you all today and 
update the website resources that I have and kind of redo a web, this, this presentation. It, it's been a catalyst for me, and I want to encourage you to find catalysts as well. We'll go to the next slide. We all need to be advocating for media literacy. And I think I'm preaching to the choir here because you probably wouldn't be here if you didn't believe in media literacy and believe in these topics. But attending the Summer Institute in Digital Literacy, which again, this year will be back in Providence, Rhode Island, um, the week of July 9th, um, supporting uh, organizations like the National Association for Media Literacy Education, you know, celebrating and having events for Media Literacy Week each year. Any ways that you can think to advocate for media literacy, to advocate for the inclusion in the curriculum, the formal curriculum of what we're requiring students uh, to have in middle school and high school. I think all of those things are important because again, I don't think we're going to media literacy ourselves out of political polarization, but I do think it's essential and it's not only essential for students, it's essential for adults as well. Next slide. For tonight's presentation. I have actually created, but I've been wanting to do this for some time, um, a private Facebook group. Given the nature of the culture war and the fact that unfortunately, any of us at any time, if we would publicly post on Twitter or other kinds of social media, you know, something about a, a, a cultural hot button issue, you know, something could be blown up, something could be taken out of proportion. I really feel like it's important for a, for a group that's focusing on this to be a, a, a private group. So you can visibly see that this group is out there if you search for conspiracies and culture wars. Um, but I will approve anybody that joins that. And my initial intention for this, and it could evolve into something more, but my initial intention for this is as a resource sharing, um, uh, resource sharing site. So if you go to the next slide, I really believe all of us can, can help each other in huge ways as we filter information, <clears throat> because each of us live in a different sphere. We have access to different people and different experiences. And so you can think of this project, which I use, the, I've been using the hashtag uh, ConCW for Conspiracies and Culture Wars since 2019, as basically a powerful information filter. I use a tool called If This Then That, so that whenever I share a tweet that uses that hashtag, Conspiracies and Culture Wars, it puts that, that link and that information onto a Google Doc. Well, since 2019, I think after four pages, it creates a new Google Doc. I've got 41 Google Docs now for Conspiracies and Culture Wars for all these resources. And so, and, and now I'm, I'm using Mastodon, I'm, I'm cross-posting at this point. But if you go to the next slide, I have basically taken a large number of those links, some of the best, and I've now categorized them um, into the following media categories. And there's a lot more than four in there because I did this screenshot before I'd added, I think there's about 17 books in there. So books, podcasts, articles, videos, and student projects. And so I would, uh, and then if you scan that QR code, uh, actually, ooh, huh. I think that will actually allow you to collaborate on the Wakelet. Um, so I may have to look at that because I didn't, I, I, I'm new to sort of new to using Wakelet. I've only been using it like in the last year. Um, and I created a space for these, but these are separate collections. So I actually, I may change the, I may, I may change the sharing because my intent was not to let anybody, you know, edit those, but in the, in the Facebook group, anybody who's a member can, can share resources. And, you know, I've read a number of, of books, as I'm sure you all have, that relate to some of these topics. I love listening to podcasts. I, I generally listen to, you know, a, a, at least one, at least a part of a podcast a day, because I, I have about a 20 minute commute, you know, each way to school. And, um, you know, there's there's a wealth of, of resources. And for me, this whole project has really been about trying to put the pieces together and understand a little bit better what the heck is going on uh, with respect to a lot of these issues surrounding the culture war and conspiracies. And these are resources that that have helped me and I think can continue to help us uh, connect the dots. We can go to the next slide. I want to caution us all to consume this media. Um, oops, you may have to, yeah, I think you may have clicked the wakelet. So if you just close that tab and go back to the slides, I probably did change the sharing for that. There you go. And then you're just going to click the arrow. Yeah. I think you may have to click the slide. Sorry. I think I made that a hyperlink. Try to just click your arrow key and go right arrow. There you go. Consume in moderation <laughs> because, um, you know, sadly, there is a lot of darkness out there in the world. 
And I think we are going to do a disservice to ourselves if we choose to marinate in the culture war a tremendous amount of time every single day. Yet I think there are important obligations that we have as educators to be aware of the issues that are happening in our world, and then also to be able to constructively educate students around them, especially as they intersect with literacy, with civics, uh, with the responsibilities of citizenship. Next slide. Now, this last one is going to sound grandiose, but I really think that you should consider running for political office. Do you know that in 2018, over 170 teachers ran for state office? And that actually resulted in a lot more females being elected to political office, which I think was fantastic. But a lot more teachers had their voices, you know, in state legislatures around the country. Uh, in Oklahoma, where I just moved from, you know, there was, there was a huge strike and there was just, we've had, we had extremely tumultuous times. But we need to be able to share our voices and we need to have, I believe, citizens who are educated with respect to media literacy and the importance of media literacy and education overall being more involved in our political process. So if you don't run for political office, let's find other, other educators and other folks um, who have an understanding of the importance of media literacy and education for citizenship in our nation and let's support those folks um, who, who run. And I guess that wasn't last. I have seven. My last one is refuse to remain silent. This is so important because it is so easy. And I'm not saying we all need to go confront people and we certainly don't need to be ugly with anyone. But I think that we need to amplify ideas, people, and media that can help us better understand and, and make sense of the world and also make informed decisions about the kinds of media and the voices that we're going to allow to, to influence us and, and possibly to really shape our not only our perceptions of the world, but even our own identities. Uh, there's a lot going on with this, but I think we each have really important roles to play. And I hope that that some of the work that I've done might be able to help you in terms of media filtering and, and finding resources. Sometimes I know when I hear a, a, a presentation or go to a conference, the number one best thing that, that I walk away from is a book that I read later or a podcast that I listen to, because that really lets me dive deep into those ideas and, and into that whole genre. And so as we collaborate and that hashtag Obviously, anybody can use a hashtag. Nobody worldwide that I know of, besides myself and and uh, and sometimes Brian, are using the conspiracies, the, the con CW. You know, that's a way. The Facebook groups a way. There's other ways that we can that we can um, collaborate. So, in conclusion, if we'll go to the next slide. This is really weird because I don't know why my uh, my smart speaker was going to play "Losing My Religion," but that is the song that I wanted to reference here. Uh, REM uh, came out with that in uh, 1991 in their Out of Time magazine or in their Out of Time album. And it's a challenging time that we live in. Um, I've, I've had some opportunities. Uh, we had a camp out at the end of last year for our, our uh, sixth graders. I had a chance to visit with a parent that was absolutely had the most nihilistic worldview of anyone I, I think I've ever met before. It was very, very depressing to visit with this fellow. Um, you know, there are there's all kinds of perspectives out there. There's all kinds of rabbit holes to fall into. And the conclusion that I want to leave you with, we'll go on to the next slide, um, is that we don't need to, to fall into that rabbit hole. We don't need to, to you know, become nihilists and, and, and believe that, that there's no hope. Uh, you know, I don't think I am, I know that I'm not the, the same naively idealistic person I was in 1991 when I was at the Air Force Academy, um, but I am still incredibly optimistic about the potential that each one of us has as educators, as members of our community, as citizens, to help make this nation into an even better nation than it was yesterday. One of my favorite books is Virginia Postrel's book, The Future and Its Enemies. And instead of just saying conservative liberal, she talks about the statists and the dynamists. And the dynamists are the people that will sort of seize hold of the opportunities that the changing world and the changing landscape that we live in offers and, and try to ride the wave and try to adapt and change rather than, than really fighting and trying to stop the, stop the tide or stop the change. So I wouldn't say that I'm a, a Jetsons level um, you know, idealist as far as you know, some of the idealism. There's a lot of things 
with respect to the Jetsons and the values that that show represented. But I do think that we can make some good choices about what we choose to marinate in, in terms of, of media and ideas. And as we collaborate um, and we strive together to be better teachers ourselves and better educators uh, and raise better citizens, that we're going to make a positive impact. Um, we can go to the last slide. So that's it. Do you all have any questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, Leslie, that's have been fantastic. That was really great. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, so I will stop the record here and we can take it to um, take it to uh, Q and a time.